All right. So, Buju in Dinaway Maginadog. I be Nin in Dijnaka Jaginashimong. Awanakwe Ojibwe Mong. Gitchi Onegamine in Dunjaba. American Indian Community Housing Organization, INDA. Um, hello, everyone. Hello, all my relatives. Uh, my name is Ivy Vineo. My pronouns are she, her. And I uh, work as the culture program coordinator at ACO in one of my roles. And we are really thankful that you joined us tonight, even though we rescheduled the session. Um, and uh, this session tonight is Zungadeowin, Healing Through Sobriety, with um, special guests uh, Scott Thompson, Sashin Goslin, and Julia Butler. Um, right now, we want to ask you to put in the chat what uh, traditional ancestral tribal lands you reside on. So if you could do that right now, the people that just came on. Uh, I work and reside in Onegaminsin, uh, Duluth, Minnesota, which is the ancestral, traditional, um, contemporary lands of the Anishinaabe, the Dakota, and the Nor Northern Cheyenne and other tribe tribal nations. And before I turn it over to Dr. Mary Owen, tonight's facilitator, I'd like to inform you a little bit about uh, the American Indian Community Housing Organization, ACL. Who is co which is hosting this session tonight. ACO is an Indigenous-led, people-first nonprofit in Onigaminsing, Duluth, Minnesota, where we provide housing, a domestic violence shelter, family and culture programming, cultural arts center, um, Indigenous-centered retail space. We do so much. Indigenous food sovereignty initiatives, Indigenous health, um, and more. All of our work is anchored in our mission, which is to honor the resiliency of indigenous people by strengthening communities and centering indigenous values into all aspects of our work. Our philosophy is that every American Indian deserves to live in nonviolent and non-threatening environment and has the right to be treated with dignity and respect. We wanna thank the funder for tonight's session, which is the Minnesota Department of Human Services, Behavioral Health Division, through our tradi traditional healing grant. Um, so a big miigwech to them for sponsoring this session. And we want to, I want to go over the Zoom participation rules. As you can notice, we um, have you muted, so you will stay muted through the session. And we um, don't have your Zoom videos up and those will be off for the session as well. If you have a question during the session, you can put that in the chat. I will be moderating that. Um, we will have time at the end, about 15, 20 minutes for questions, um, which we can take in the chat as well. Um, our lovely and wonderful uh, Zoom tech assistant is Tina Stromgren. So if you're having any Zoom tech um, issues, please message her directly and she'll try to help you. We are recording the session and we will we'll be sending it out to um, all of the registrants with the recording link and also the survey link. Um, so now I'm gonna turn it over to Mary Owen and Tina, can you spotlight everyone please? My name is uh, Mary Owen. I am a family practice doctor. I'm also an associate dean of native health at the University of Minnesota Medical School. And I work one day a week in the care clinic here in Duluth, Minnesota, and um, have always worked for native people, which I love. And today I get the um, pleasure of uh, asking our esteemed panel here some really great questions. But first, let's start out with them giving a little bit of introduction about themselves and their road to recovery. And I'm going to just call people by the way that I see them on my screen. And Scott, you're up first. Go ahead. Well, hi, my name is Scott Thompson. 
I'm a white earth enrollee. I live here in Duluth. I work here at ACO. Um, I'm the building manager and I maintenance, you know, maintenance on all of our buildings and stuff. Um, glad to be here. Thanks, Scott. Do you want to talk a little bit about your road to recovery? Give us a... Um, sure. I, I've been... I. I started my use probably when I was nine years old and I've had serious trouble with it all my life nonstop. I, I think uh, six years ago was when I finally, I, I watched family members close up die, right? I mean, literally die in the hospital and in such bad shape. And I, I was, I had a lot of fear and I, I didn't know what to do. And I, I finally, a, finally asked for help. I fi finally asked for help. I lowered my pride. I always thought, you know, that I didn't need help. I'm a man, all this, you know, stupid stuff. And uh, I asked for help and I went into, well, talked to my brother, Arnie Vinio, and I talked to uh, um, a few other people and I, and I got into treatment right away and I went out to MASH and I went, I, I didn't, I didn't fight anything. I just totally submitted to whatever was going to be, was going to be, I, I had no choice because then my next step was death. I, I'm a, I know it was death and I, I, I give, I surrendered. I, however, this is going to be, whatever I've got to do, I have to do it. And I, and I never asked questions. I just, and I'm, and I'm here today. I'm thankfully here today, grateful and grateful for every day. And, and happy, and and finally, you know, I I I've, I've achieved something that I I didn't think would happen. I I thought I was just gonna die like every, a lot of members of my family. Just alcohol was gonna just take me, you know. And I was totally, almost, almost willing to let that happen until I seen it happening to a few a few a sister and a brother, and I was like, I can't do this, you know. I don't want to die that way. So, and so fearful, fear helped me a lot. And, but now I, I, I feel great. I, life is really good, you know, and I owe a lot of that to ACO too, they, for taking me on and giving me the means to do what I didn't know I knew how to do, <laughs> you know, and that's, and that's helped this building and help people. Thanks, Scott. It's fantastic. Sashin. Bonjour. My name is Sashin Goslin. I am Prairie Band Potawatomi, uh, Red Cliff Ojibwe, and Kickapoo of Kansas. I grew up on the shores of Lake Superior um, over in beautiful Bayfield, Wisconsin. Um, so I was really nervous um, doing something like this. My sobriety is something that's um, very fresh to me. Um, I've been sober about 15 months, I would say, uh, you know, I'm just starting, I'm just starting to understand, um, how it's affecting me and how I'll move forward. So it's like super nerve wracking, um, to be on here. Um, but I'm so glad to be doing this with Scott and Julia. Like I am so lucky to be surrounded by them and Ivy too. Um, we have really great people here, um, at ACO. Um, so we live in a society uh, that idolizes alcohol, and it is really tough. Like from young ages, you hear about kids talking about they can't wait to have a drink. They can't wait to go to a bar and party. Like kids as young as seven years old are doing this. I have family members who started drinking when they were around seven. And now, you know, they live a really tough life. And um, when I was younger, I couldn't wait for that day, that day until uh, I could have a drink where it was okay for me to have a drink. And um, I think I was about 18 years old. So quite a, well, not that long ago, I'm still pretty young, but um, it was exciting. I lived that life. I lived that party life that I dreamed of and I wanted to be fast paced and meet all these people that I'll never remember, never see again. And I did it for a long time. And um, 
I felt like I was losing myself. Um, I disconnected myself from my culture. Living that lifestyle, I didn't go to ceremonies. I didn't go to powwows. I didn't dance. And um, as I got a little bit older, uh, I realized I didn't want to live that lifestyle anymore. But in the society that we're in, it's really hard to make that first step. And it took me years. I knew it was coming. I knew that I had to stop drinking. And um, I didn't know why, though. And uh, I found, well, I, I still am. I'm finding my purpose in life. And my purpose is to serve our people to the best of my ability. And to do that, I have to be sober. I have to be my best self to be able to fully serve our communities. And that, that's what that's what I plan to do for the rest of my life. And that's what keeps driving me. Um, that's what brought me to ACO. I've been here a year now and I can't imagine life without it, without taking that step. Um, we are all here together. We're learning how to live a better life together. And that's why I'm here. That's why I landed here. I truly believe that we go through these things in life for a reason. Like I did this stuff for a reason. I landed here for a reason. I'm here today for a reason. And um, I'm really lucky. I look forward to in 40 years celebrating my sobriety anniversary, you know. I look forward to celebrating every year. I I look forward to talking about this stuff. And um, I'm just, I'm so lucky. I'm so lucky to be here today and to be um, sitting on this this panel with these amazing people. Miigwech. Thank you, Sashin. It was amazing. Julia. Anin Buju, Wam Sister Kwan Squacious, Nindish Nakaz, Nindu Jaba St. Croix, Chippewa, Indians of Wisconsin. Um, hello, my name is Julia Butler. I am uh, 27 years old and um, I'm from St. Croix. I currently live in Duluth, Minnesota. Um, my mother is from Fond du Lac and my dad's from St. Croix. I've been in recovery uh, for about a little over two and a half years now. Um, I started using uh, real young in my teenage years. Um, and yeah, that uh, the start of my use was due to, you know, abuse and stuff. And I just wanted to escape, you know. So, so yeah, what, um, what got me into my recovery was I was pregnant with my second child, um, still heavy into my addiction. And um, I had went to jail on an old warrant and I got put in um, Carlton County Treatment Court and they had put me in treatment and um, put, I got an MAT, Medicaid Assistant Treatment, and um, that helped me. I was able to bring in my daughter um, into, uh, healthy and uh, yeah, since then I've, I've been able to start college. I'm going for my LADC. And I was able to do an intern at ACO that has been amazing that it was for a short time, but it was really like it opened my eyes to to letting me believe in myself and, you know, opening doors to what I want to do. And that's to help my people are uh, in, the, in the Native community. So um, I'm very nervous to, to do this, but also very grateful and excited to be a part of this. So, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Julia. That's fantastic. All of you uh, pointed out some common themes, one starting young, but the more importantly, this one of the ways that you came out of this was your um, commitment to our communities and wanting to serve, um, which I hear all the time whenever I'm around Native people. And so it's, it's a phenomenal strength that we have that we continue to rely on. But I do want to ask you about some um, more specific barriers to uh, to so to um, so sovereignty, to sobriety, and how you um, you know how you maintain despite those barriers. And I'll start with you, Scott. Barriers to sobriety. Um, some of my barriers. I, I, I mine was I, I. I don't think I really had very many barriers because I I always I grew up in a white community. You know, so I always 
thought that I was part of that white community. And I'm, I'm still very distanced, you know, from the native community, except for working here, you know? And so I, I mean, I, I really didn't have very many barriers. I, I just reached out to whatever I could and whatever was, you know, but my biggest barrier to me was me, you know, I was the only thing stopping me and I, and I couldn't let go of some of the friends. I, I, they were important to me, I thought, until I walked away and then I seen how unimportant I was to them, you know, and then that, I guess that would have been a barrier, you know, but, but I had so many people behind me, you know, I, my family was behind me. None of them ever, we sell, we made everything like my family made everything every day of my recovery journey important. And we still do. And I still make it important. I, I always, you know, when you get a milestone or you know, another 30 days or something, celebrate it, you know, even if you have to do it by yourself, go out and buy yourself a chocolate shaker, a banana split or something, you know, do something, you know, simple, but, you know, hey, you know, I feel good, you know, that I did that, you know. As long as it's only every 30 days, Scott, because as a doctor, <laughs> I don't, I'm not going to replace that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, well, it could be every day now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, Sheen? So, my biggest barrier was myself. Like, I always say, like, um, I'm always standing in my own way. Like, I get in the way of myself <laughs> and it's not just with sobriety. It could be with just about anything. And that like, what I mean by that is being in your head. You're always in your head thinking like my brain doesn't shut off. And it's like, I had to um, convince myself that it was the right thing to do. And it's like, I knew it, like I knew it in my heart that I needed to get sober, but convincing my head to do that, that's tough that was my biggest barrier. And it's something that I still battle and I expect to. Um, I literally stand in my own way sometimes and um, got to get over it. Well, we got to push through it because I don't know if we'll ever get over it. Um, yeah. It, so this last year, actually, um, it's easy to celebrate the plus sides of getting sober, but also the reality is that it's tough. And it'll probably be tough for life. There will be will be moments where it's like so easy to slide off the wagon, you know, and then it's like you got to get back on and start all over again. And New Year's this year was tough for me. I knew it. And um, that was like a reminder of that. I got to keep working. I got to keep working on myself and I got to keep working on my sobriety and keep doing the things that I need to do to keep my head healthy to keep my mental health healthy because that's what's keeping me sober as soon as you decline you know you can lose everything in the blink of an eye and it all comes back to our personal well-being we got to take care of ourselves um you see like a lot of our relatives when they're drinking they don't take care of themselves anymore and it could be just about anything you know themselves their households their kids their families. That's a lot of stuff um, to, you know, give it all to. And um, that's something that's like hard to come to terms with. And um, it's just, it's an important reminder that we have to take care of ourselves during this too. And um, even though I hope all of my hard times go away, I do hope like I keep experiencing them because it's a reminder like I need that reminder that I need to take care of myself first and um in in like the the job that I do um I can't fully give myself to someone else or to our community if I don't take care of myself first and I'm learning that now <laughs> and um I hope to keep building off of it um the more that I'm able to take care of myself the bigger input I can make on this community. And that's the direction that I wanna go. Sometimes be, um, being taking care of yourself is being in community, not having to care for people, but like being at the powwow, being at other things that are 
you know, part of who we are. So you also mentioned a barrier at the very beginning that was, I think is really critical to talk, um, that you mentioned was uh, just the constant, constant pressure all around us. And every single thing is a celebration that requires alcohol these days, it feels like sometimes. So I think that was important to point out um, how that's just the norm and it's really sad. Julia. Um, I would say some of the barriers I had were, um, I guess, uh, being in, being under the influence for so long, um, I was used to just numbing my feelings, not feeling anything. The only thing I would either feel would be super angry or a mediocre feeling of happy, you know, and so that once, um, once uh, you get into early recovery, having all those feelings come at you, you know, that I would, that would be very hard for me to deal with, you know, and I would easily want to run back to my, my drug of choice. Um, so I think um, my mental health was like a huge, you know, like a huge barrier for me. Uh, another thing being that um, I was, um, I used opiates would be the cravings and the, um, the triggers and the withdrawals. You know, I couldn't go like a couple hours to a day without using because it, I'd be too sick. You know, I would have those uh, physical withdrawals and they were horrible. So uh, that would probably be some of the barriers that um, I had to deal with. Thanks, Julia. That mental health one is such an important one. You know, I mean, that's why a lot of our folks do end up um, using some substance or another, right? To numb, to get out of their own heads. So that ten, that temptation to want to get out of your own head again and having it be constant would be tough. So thank you so much for sharing that. Really good. Um, how about what it feels like to be sober? And Julie, I'm going to start back with you. We're going to go the other way. What does it feel like to be sober? <laughs> it feels, oh my, I've, this is the longest time I've been in recovery for myself, um, being sober and um, I'm now a mother of three. Um, so being able to be that active parent in my children's lives, um, being able to build those relationships that I didn't have um, with my family, you know, the, it, it feels great. And also to love myself and know that know that I have the confidence in myself, you know, I can look in the mirror and say, you know, I'm, I feel great. I feel beautiful and things are going to be okay. Um, another thing that's great about being in recovery is knowing that ev for me, everything happens for a reason. And regardless of what mountain or molehill of a problem it might be that I can get over, get through it with the, with my support network, with my friends and family, with therapy, um, so just being able to do that and also experience, you know, little things like uh, I, I, little things like going on, um, going outside and playing with my children, you know, that that's that's great that that feeling of, wow, I'm having fun, you know, <laughs> like I, I'm going to remember this time with my kids. So, uh, yeah, it, it just feels really great. Um, and I can show my children that any, you know, you can follow your dreams and anything is possible, basically. <laughs> Thanks, Julia. So I like that, um, enjoying time with your kids and then holding on to that memory. So you're not losing chunks of your life. Yeah. Thank you. Sashin, what does it feel like to be sober? Uh, it's freaking beautiful, Mary. <laughs> it's arguably arguably the best decision that I've ever made like some days I feel like I am just glowing <laughs> and um you are <laughs> <laughs> for a while it's like why why you know why and then you know it like clicks and it's like you know it's going right I'm on my path I'm on the path for the rest of my life I feel great um I just I can't imagine going back I'm only going forward I always think about uh, the type of leader that I want to be, and it's one that leads by example. And so I hope that by living my life this way, that I can encourage other people to live the same way or to try their best um, 
we can only determine like what that is ourselves. And so like what I determine my best life to be may not be the same as someone else's and that's okay. Um, we're here to live a happy life, to live a good life. <laughs> and um, I, like I said, it's arguably the best decision that I have ever made. And I look forward to what comes next while I'm on this journey. Thanks. I think you've beautifully described Native leadership already, you know, working for our community, what we do for our community, but then also that role modeling, that positive role modeling, live in a good way. Thanks for that, Sashin. Scott, what does it feel like to be sober? Wow. Um, it's like everybody else is saying, it is, this is the most incredible journey I have ever been on. I, I wish, you know, I know this can't happen, but I wish I would have started it sooner. Just, but it wasn't meant to be, you know, I, I, every, everything that I had lost in my, in my alcoholism, I, I waited and waited and waited and I prayed and I, you know, and, and it has come back, you know, I, I had lost my children. I, I was distant from my family. They didn't want me around, you know, for obvious reasons. I had alcohol on my breath 95% of the time or was half lit. And I, I was, I got, I got that back and just, just to have, just to have the the knowledge i don't get to see everybody every day but i get to text everybody every day and that's important that makes me happy that you know and and plus my my thing is you know a lot of our people here that we work with our kids and our they they don't have uh, people that show up every day for them well if all i have to do is show up and fix something they're going to see that hey he showed up every day he's there every day to do something he doesn't they don't know what i do but he was here every day and and that's what if that's all i got to do and you know if that's all i can give you know i i guess i'm i'm going to accept that as good enough and that makes me happy you know and and hanging with everybody and you know this is fun make life fun you know and it does, it does get fun. And after a while, the cravings and the, boy, I wish I was out drinking with the crew, that all goes away. So in, it just, it just, it's not a, it's not a thought anymore. It's, as a matter of fact, the further you get away from the, your back there, it seems like that part of me almost seems like, but that wasn't really me. Man, that wasn't me. I, I wasn't like that, you know? But being happy, I mean, just to have the things I have today. I, I wouldn't have them if my, you know, like my kids. I'm so happy they're in my life. That's what makes me happy is, is the people in my life. It's not money. It's not cars. It's not this, all this fancy, fine stuff. It's, 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 it's them. It's, it's us. It's you guys. It's let's meet, hang out, you know. That's, what, that's the stuff. That's cool, Scott. And I would say that what you're doing is far better than good enough. So, miigwetch for always being there for those kids. That's cool. Mm -hmm. So, Sheen, let's let's go back to you, and I want to ask you, what keeps you sober? I always think about um, how I'm stubborn. <laughs> My parents would agree, <laughs> but um, that plays a big part is that I want to be the best person that I can be. And I know that that is without alcohol. And part of that is I got to get out of my own way. And that's what I'm going to do. And um, understanding too who I am, who I'm meant to be. And that's exciting. And um, like a really big part of my journey is understanding where we came from. So our native people went through heck and um, we still feel the effects today. And so part of my sobriety is understanding that and what, like what my grandma, my great grandma and great, great, great grandma went through 
it wasn't that long ago. Um, colonization played a big part and still is on how we operate today. And um, I'm a master student right now at the University of Minnesota Duluth studying uh, tribal administration. And I chose that field to better understand who I am and the people that I'm working with. You know, we're all one, we're all the same. And um, that's like one, one big influence, one big thing that drives me. Um, I don't know if we'll ever, you know, go back to who we were like pre-colonization, but we can live our best life or try to live our best life and understanding that um is a big part of what I do um yeah thanks Sasheen I totally re um relate to that uh, it helps drive me to get up every morning sometimes that anger and that stubbornness they're not going to take us down <laughs> so miigwech Julia you what keeps um, you sober some of the things that keep me sober uh is a little bit of fear. Um, who I am today and what I have today, meaning the people, um, the confidence, how, my mental health. You know, um, I know how I felt and I know how it was when I didn't have all that, when I didn't have my sobriety or my recovery. And that scares me, you know, to lose, to, to lose myself, to lose the people I love. and. Um, to lose the things that I've worked for, you know? So a little bit of, of fear is what keeps me sober. Also, um, the, the, ter the determination to be the best person I can be for myself, my children, you know, my family, my community. Um, and I wanna show people who are struggling with addiction, you know, like I, you can do it, there's hope. You know, and um, also I, I want to be able to be there for people, you know, to, to, to whether that be to listen to them or however I can help them in a good way, you know, and I, I, I want, um, I want to be that person that was there for me in my early recovery, you know, so, so that, that's what keeps me sober as well as uh, my support network. And of course, my children. Thank you. So some of those themes that we've heard, caring about your community, also some of that same stubbornness that Sasheen has. But then also that, um, that I'm glad that you mentioned the fear because that's very real and, uh, and can be a motivator. You know, no, no, yeah. no back. Yeah, I, um, uh, when I was, when I just got into recovery, when I was pregnant, uh, they opened after I had um, my daughter, they opened up, you know, a CPS case because I was in active use during my pregnancy. Um, I had got that case closed, but then I had relapsed again. And um, CPS, you know, came and uh, gave my kids to my mother for a little bit. But that thought or that feeling of not being able to be there for them and being the mother I want to be. And the thought of having to put um, put the stress on my mother, you know, she, she's 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 the grandma. She's lived her life. She's raised her kids. You know what I mean. So, kind of um, having to do that to her in a way uh, that that scares me. And I, I that pain that I felt, I I will never <laughs> will never have to you know go through that again. Thanks, Julia. Scott, what keeps you sober? I still go to AA meetings, not as regular as I used to, maybe once or twice a week. Um, I, I have pretty much, I, I was talking about cross addiction and I, I work a, a lot, you know? I mean, I, I leave here at eight to 4.30 or longer here if I need to be. And I'll go on and, work another four or five hours or into dark, you know, on other stuff, just, just to help people, you know, to help people out to, I, 
everybody says I need to slow down and you need to relax and you know and but they they don't realize that I I like that part of, I like that stuff I like to work I like to, I have tools I you know and that I I like to I like to work <laughs> it doesn't hurt me and and God or the creator whatever you want to say has given me the ability to do it and well then I'm going to do it you know, and, and, and I can pick and choose if, if I want to do it tonight. If I, if I'm tired, I'll go home. If I don't, I will carry on and I'll go do some more stuff, you know, and I got lots of friends in recovery. I'm in touch with them every day on text. We talk, we, you know, if I have something, I'll, I'll, if I have questions, I bring them up, you know, and, and we bounce stuff off of each other and, you know, and I'm, you know, so I, and, and plus I'm interested to see what tomorrow is going to bring, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I get out of bed pretty, I'm grateful with a grateful heart. I wake up and I mm, wonder what's going to be, what's, what's going to happen today. You know, let's, let's do some more. I'm, I'm willing to do some more. I'm willing to learn some more and I'm willing to do as much as, you know, needs to be done. That's really cool, Scott. That I think you named something really important, just a love for life. Yeah. I'm, I'm hearing and seeing that in everybody here. So very cool. Before we um, turn to questions, I want to ask you all if you have any um, tips or things um, uh, that you wish that you had heard earlier or, you know, things that you think might be helpful to someone. Julia, let's start with you. Do you have anything? And no, and no worries if you can't think of anything right now, just say pass. Okay, I think the biggest tip is to, in, for me, in early recovery, um, and I'm sure for a lot of other people, the stubbornness, the not wanting to change, you know, everything, people, places, and things, literally everything, and to just let things happen how they're supposed to happen. So kind of, um, it's okay to not have to be in charge all the time. You know, um, I would say that's probably the biggest tip and to always um, make sure you have your support network and to to not be afraid to ask for help. So those are the tips I have. Huge. Thank you so much. Sashin? So um, I would say that it's really important to remember that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. It gets better. There will be better days. Better days are ahead. It's worth it. It's worth taking the risk of sobering up to see what comes next, like Scott said, to be excited about life. And um, just know that everyone on this call too has a support system and all of us on here. Mary, Julia, Scott, and I. And um, like I briefly mentioned earlier, like this made me really nervous. I don't talk about my sobriety very often. And um, really the only person I talk about it at work with is Scott and Ivy. And um, I had a real conversation with Scott before on sobriety and he was over here and lit up the stage. And I was like, dang, I'm home. <laughs> and he smugged me right there. <laughs> and one of the hardest things will be talking about it. And it will be because we're not used to it. It's hard. It's hard talking about ourselves and our struggles, but it'll get better. It does get better. That's what I have to say. Thanks, Sashin. Scott, any last words of advice? Well, I would say if you're struggling to and you, and you want something, ask for help and then and then submit to that help. Don't don't try and do it things on your own. You know, you're, you're going to asking for help is hard. It's, it's hard for everybody, you know, and I just, just do it, get brave enough to do it. And, and then, and then follow all the program stuff that you get into. If you get into a treatment or something, follow it completely to the end and, and listen to your counselors and your caseworkers and whatever you have. It took me to do that. And it, and I think I've been in treatment. I don't know how many times I, five maybe five times 
DWIs and stuff like that. And you just get sick of losing. I got sick of losing. So stand up for yourself, you know, and, and, and ask for help. Miigwech to you all. This is um, fantastic stories. <clears throat> and we're going to hear a little bit more from you because people in the audience have some questions. But before I turn it over to Ivy to ask some of those questions that are in the audience, I do want to say <clears throat> as a physician that I've taken care of people now for 20 years. And I feel very strongly, have always felt very strongly that we really need to push back and make sure that people know there's no shame in alcoholism. It takes every, I've never seen any type of person that alcoholism doesn't affect or cause a, you know, impact. Um, it's just a disease. And sometimes um, you guys have all hit on the keys to getting through it. Sometimes it, don't worry if it doesn't, I mean, it's frustrating, but don't beat up on yourself if it doesn't take the first time. Like Scott said, it took five tries. Some people it takes more, sometimes less. It doesn't matter. The point is to get up and do it again because life is worth living for and we have communities to take care of. So I wanna thank you all for allowing me to participate in your stories and I'll turn it over to Ivy. Uh, miigwech, Dr. Owen. Uh, miigwech to all of you, Scott, Julia, and Sashin. Um, I'm so glad that we recorded this session so that it can be replayed for people over and over again and can be it could be used in treatment centers and everything that you you shared really hit home I'm sure with a lot of people and I just want to say that you all have strong hearts you all have zoom good day when and I just I'm so happy that this came together and that you shared what you shared. So miigwech. Um, we, um, this is time for questions. So if you have a question for any of our panelists or uh, you have just general questions, you could put that in your chat, in the chat. And I can ask those to the, to, to the panelists. So this is your time to, to ask your question. We do have one that was sent to me privately. Um, so this one's for Sashin. So Sashin, um, this is the message. Sashin brings up a good point with the generational effects of alcoholism addiction. Do family members have a means of recovery from the effects of addiction? I don't know it if there's a right answer, you know, we got to keep trying. And um, a big part of my sobriety is understanding it. And it's really hard for our people to understand, like to, to comprehend it because we really feel that stuff. And um, we will for generations. So like when I um, first meet people, I look at their hands. First thing I look at backs of their hands because I believe it, it tells me who that person is, what they do, what they've been through. I look at my hands and I see my grandma. I see the things that she went through. I see um, the trauma that our families have sustained. And I see um, resiliency. I see what we're doing now. I see what the next seven generations will do. You know, I see this all in the back of my hands. <laughs> so I don't think that there's a right answer to how we can solve our problems. But I know that we'll keep making these small steps to live these better lives um, to address it. Miigwech, Sashin. Uh... Any, are there any other questions from the audience? I want to add something to what Sashin said. I think mm -hmm. the most successful forms of sobriety are when, and, and Scott alluded to this too, and so did Julia, when families can be involved. <clears throat> and I would advocate even when the entire community could be involved because we, as Sashin has pointed out beautifully, this has impacted our entire community. And if we all get involved in the solution, and support all of our um, community members, we're gonna do that much better. And I think treatment programs need to recognize that <clears throat> and be built around that model. 
Uh, Scott, can you share a little bit more about um, um, having your both of your kids, they weren't a part of your life for many years and and how long they've been um, part of your life now and just how that feels for you and 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 all of that and and if you can share like how many years of sobriety you are in right now well i'm i'm entering into my sixth going into my seventh year early into my seventh year but i'm at celebrating six years and uh my kids have been out of my life since they were probably four and five maybe guessing not a good timekeeper um and uh that 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 drove me they i mean they were taken basically you know my alcoholism had a lot to do with it but they were pretty much just taken from me and and moved a far a long ways away so i didn't have access to them and uh seeing them or talking to them they were just you know and that drove me almost to a suicidal alcoholism you know i i I, I was, that was my thoughts, you know, is, is I, I was going to drink myself to death because of this, because they were taken, they were, you know, and they're in my life, they've been in my life now for probably the last five years, just, I mean, physically, they come and visit me and, oh, we just, we just love each other and all, you know. And it's, oh, that I, somebody, one of my sister, Sherry said one time, you got to chase your dreams. And I, I said, I said, they're answered. I said, that's all I wanted. That's all I really wanted was my children back in my life and my family things back in order and, and my license. And I didn't set my dreams high because I, I, at some point in my life, I didn't seriously think I had the chance to make big dreams, you know, because, because I thought I would fail again, because I've proven myself so many times in the past that I did fail. You know, I mean, I didn't fail, but I, I, my alcoholism came back, you know, to me and, and, and dragged me down again, you know, and again, and again, so many times that I, that I didn't set big dreams. And, you know, I'm 50s, I just turned 56 and I mean, if I make a few nice vacations in my future, um, hey, that's dreams good enough for me too, you know, you know. But I, life is good, it really is. So, and and to have my babies back in my life, that's that's the most important thing in my life. Now, oh, Miigwech. Um, we have a comment here. I want to congratulate all of you for your journeys into recovery and thank you for sharing your stories. It's great to hear and see your happiness and joy for life now. I am also proud that you all want to give back to your communities. Yes, yes. So we have about 10 minutes. So um, if there's anything else that you wanted to share that you didn't share when the questions were asked, any of you could just share that now, or uh, Mary, if you have thought of another question, or if there's a question from the audience, please put it in the chat. I have a question. What would you like, <clears throat> when you think about um, your family and friends, is there anything you'd like to tell them or want them to know about your going through sobriety? Because sometimes I think people tiptoe around um, the issue and they're not quite sure how to talk to you about the whole, about alcoholism, you know, still treating it like it's something shameful. So what would you tell them as far as talking about alcoholism <clears throat> and how you're doing? Anybody? Well, I would, I would say if they're, if they're, they want to, do say anything don't don't bring up the past and beat people over the head with what you did back then you know don't don't do that but you know but you can approach people and and i mean me i i try to make myself approachable and it, i mean it's it's good to hear things about the past you know because it's it's a teaching you're always in a teaching thing that way but 
but some of the bad stuff you don't have to bring. Remember when you did, you know, I wouldn't do that, but but some stuff it is good to hear, you, you know, even even if it's bad, it's it's still good to hear because we need to hear that. That's how we that's how we you know that's how we heal too. You know, some of it has to be said. So I have a, I have a hard time. Well, it's getting easier, but, um, hard time telling people I don't drink. It's such an awkward conversation. You know, when they invite you to do something, Oh, you want to, it's like, no. <laughs> and telling someone I'm sober and them understanding me, you know, it's tough because a lot of the times they're not going to understand it. They're not going to understand my reasons. And I'm going to, you know, spend hours trying to explain why I'm sober <laughs> and that's not going to happen. And um, it's tough, <laughs> it's so tough. And um, um, yeah, I, I, I just keep thinking about it. Like um, recently I went to an event and um, my friends were drinking, they were having drinks. And um, I grabbed a, like, it was like orange juice and tonic water and sipped it and um, someone like made a joke about it, how it didn't have alcohol in it. One of my other friends was like, Hey, Hey, she's sober. She doesn't drink. That's okay. She can have that. <laughs> and that felt good because I don't talk about this a lot. And the fact that that person was just like, Whoa, you know, <laughs> um, that made me feel good. Now that people, um, you know, I, I go to events, I go to dinner with people who drink and that's a risk that I do take. And, um, I have friends that understand that, that I will always turn down alcohol. And I have friends that will invite me still to these things and be like, you're not drinking though. <laughs> you know, you're not allowed to drink. I've had someone tell me that recently. You're not allowed to drink. And I was like, thank you for saying that. <laughs> like, keep telling me that because that keeps myself accountable. But that also tells me that I have people behind me, even though that they don't choose this way of life, that means that they support me. And that's, I get, that's my support system. I never um, thought of it quite like that until right now that, you know, a big part of my sobriety is this family that I have standing behind me. And, you know, we're not blood family and that's okay. And that's um, what makes this journey so beautiful and where I'm at in life and who I'm around daily. Miigwech. Yes, Miigwech. Um, we do have a question um, and um, maybe this could be the last question um, unless there's a burning question after this. Um, do you have family who attend Al-Anon or Alateen or Nar-Anon with you? Is that a thing? I didn't even know if family members can attend with you. And do they? I don't have any, I, I don't think. I, I've i been pretty transparent with my alcoholism through, I mean, everybody knew I was pretty, pretty visible when I was in my using stage, you know, I was, or else I'd hide from my family. So I didn't, I tried not to affect them as much as you can, you know, but you still affect them because they're worried about you. They wonder where you are, are you dead? Are you, you know, killed in a car accident or, you know, or in jail or, you know, so that stuff does affect people, but I, I tried to only call when I was sober, you know, which is, you know, and, and not drag them into my drama. So they didn't need a whole bunch of that. They seen enough though, you know, they, they could attend, but luckily for them, they are strong enough to not need it. You know. What about you, Julia? Um, well, a lot of, uh, my family members have, um, like my aunts, my uncles, my mother, my father have struggled with addiction and alcoholism. Um, I would say, though, um, in my active use, I, like Scott, you know, try to separate myself from, from them. But my mother, mostly, and um, my grandmother, they would, being that I was in use so young and for a long period of time, they would um, 
constantly pray for me. And I guess they, they had their their own little support group. You know, it, it wasn't so much Al-Anon or a group like that, but they had their their group of people who they could basically, she could call or text or meet up with, you know, and like, I'm really worried about Julia. I haven't heard from her. Can, do you have anyone who could reach out to her or, or whatever that, you know, whatever that may be. So, um, yeah, uh, knowing that my mom doesn't have to, or my loved ones, all of them don't have to worry about me like that in that way, you know, that, that makes me feel really good, you know, cause I know I have, <laughs> I have put them through some things, you know, so, so yeah. Oh, miigwech, Julia. So um, I want to say miigwech to um, all of you again, Dr. Owen for facilitating, Scott, Sashin, and Julia. This was, uh, we've been, ACO's been doing these sessions for, hmm, culture sessions for three years now during the pandemic, virtually. And this has to be one of my favorite top ones. Um, you all were so gracious and beautiful and giving and uh, just want to say miigwech again. Uh, miigwech to the uh, attendees. Um, this is a first that none of them stepped off. They're all still here. So that says something. <laughs> um, so miigwech to all of you and miigwech to our Zoom tech, uh, Tina, for your help. And so what happens next is um, I'm going to send out an email after this session with the, with the recording link um, and also the survey link, which Tina put into to the chat. And so uh, please fill that survey out so we can get some feedback on the session. Um, there's also a question at the end of like what other type of um, healing cultural sessions you'd like to see happen with ACO um, for community. And so um, please, please fill, just take a few minutes to, to, to fill that out. And um, this concludes our session. So miigwech, um, have a good night, have a safe night. Um, for those that are in recovery, just keep being resilient and, and be, keep being strong for your family, for, for yourself, for everyone. So miigwech and good night. Thank you. Thank you.